Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 7th, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. Welcoming back for this school committee and superintendent's update he is chair of the city of Somerville Public, uh, sorry, school committee, Carrie Norman, and director of early education for the Somerville Public School System and right-hand person to Skipper, Mary Skipper, is Dr. Lisa Q. Lisa, I, I told you I was going to drop the doctor. Is that okay? <laughs> Just fine. Okay. <laughs> Terrific. Welcome back. Um, you were back. You were first joined us in the summer. Um, we were launching and trying to figure out some of the complicated programs that were going to be launched for early education. Um, so I, I want to go to um, Carrie first. And Carrie, if you could give us a quick update. We're into three weeks of virtual and semi-virtual learning. You want to give us a quick update on how you th think things are going so far? Um, uh, with the caveat that this is not the ideal situation for any of us, but at the attendance rate has been very high, averaging around 90% of students logging on. Um, actually, just drove across town. It was nice to see groups of children distance, but with the rec programs, so that is up and running. The, this community schools. The high school is starting to do conditioning for their fall sports. So there's ways that kids are, um, there's the remote learning part at, that is happening at mostly at home. Um, and there's been a few technological hiccups, but overall going smoothly. But then, especially while the weather is warm, we are doing everything we can to get kids together safely, get to, to get kids together with adults um, in our community. And so, uh, as a parent, I can say of a high school kid, it has been going uh, significantly better than the spring. And um, I have been really impressed with the preparation and the engagement that the teachers have been able to uh, get the kids in. So fairly, fairly optimistic at this point. Um, um, Yes, I mean, optimistic for, and I think the, re, the remote learning that we have going in Somerville is uh, certainly much, much more robust than what was going on in the spring. And I would say it's also well structured. I've been talking to school committee colleagues in other districts, and, and I think we're doing okay. That said, um, I believe strongly that the best education is in person. And so, um, continue to advocate for, with the city for opening the buildings when we can do it safely for our teachers and staff but we know especially as the colder weather is coming that that in-person connection is so important so uh, I, I am cautiously optimistic lisa and i were talking about it before um the show is that i have a bird's eye view of five days a week i watch i sit here in the living room um, you know, doing Zoom meetings and everything else. And then I watch across the street. Um, there is a public school teacher. She teaches in a Boston charter school. They are fully remote. Um, she has two children in the, in the Somerville public school system. And her husband is a private contractor. So I think they're going to need a revolving door put into the front of their house because of the way that the activity works over there is that um, the kids take a break or the kids are in school. I can always tell when the kids are in school because the house is almost like a, um, like a church, like an empty church over there. You, you know they're on those laptops and mom being a school teacher, she makes sure they're on that laptop in the morning. So it's, it's interesting for me to watch from a distance how virtual learning is happening in someone's home. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Lisa, you are director of early education, and I am always interested in what the professionals think the difference is between those pre-K or K kids through about the third grade, fourth grade, in terms of how they're adapting to this. I asked Carrie the question in a previous show, um, mm -hmm. and I'm convinced this is true that the older kids, because they have always had more structure and more, um, more experience about what school is about, will adapt to this much more quickly than the younger ones. Your experience on how it's going three weeks into it with the little ones. 
Well, I, I have a couple of views um, from which I can answer this question. So part of my work, as you, as you know, is um, working with Somerville Public Schools where I oversee the preschool programming. But I also do half of my work in the community with Head Start and our preschools and childcare programs all across the city through the Somerville Partnership for Young Children. And we've been supporting them and um, actively meeting with those folks since March, since, we, since they had to close, uh, with the anticipated reopening just, uh, just after we last met, which was at the end of June. So I'd say about half to two thirds of our programs were able to reopen sometime between June and July. And then um, the remainder of them reopened um, sometime in the la in between August and September. So they're up and running as a model of uh, what we can anticipate when we're able to welcome uh, children back into the public school buildings. And so we have two parallel system happening. We have kids going to school and we have kids learning remotely. Uh, so so I, can, I can talk to both of that, but I think it's important for our community to, to know um, that those two systems are, are happening in tandem. But um, to your question about how, how are the kids doing with this doing school at home or doing school in a different way at school, um, because there are very strict guidelines about being physically distant and not sharing materials, which is a very different way for kids to learn together. Um, and I, I actually have been, you know, every few days I check in with some teachers and just see how things are going. And um, I, I got a flurry of emails back uh, with, with the words adaptable, um, engaged, eager. Um, and that comes from kids who are learning doing school at home and kids who are, um, in their preschools and childcare centers, uh, but working within the guidelines that the Department of Early Education Care has set out and that we help support. So there, there actually is, we're seeing a tremendous adaptability. Um, no young children are resilient, um, and we know that they respond well to the relationships that we forge um, as adults, and that helps them to, to be resilient and to, and to build that adaptability. So, um, and that's pre-COVID as well. So that has still stood. Um, when the relationships aren't there or when there's stress and trauma, that's when um, we start to see some uh, difficulty. Can I, can I go back for a minute? Because I don't understand not having children in the system. Help me walk through how we as a school system are helping parents mm -hmm. who are, either had to go back to work or have limited uh, capacity to assist children, how are we get, filling in those gaps for them? Say from mm -hmm. pre-K to K to one to two uh, grades. Uh, what type of programs do we have for them? Well, I mean, as you know, and you, your, your neighbors across the street are, are a good example of this, right? They've, you've watched over the last few weeks as they've, they've worked to, to figure things out. Um, and now you're sort of seeing, oh, they've gotten themselves into kind of a rhythm. Um, on the other side of their figuring it out are teachers and a school system um, who are helping to support with structures and scheduling what a day can look like. Uh, a colleague of mine gave me the phrase on Monday at a meeting, and I've been using it ever since, negotiated reality. It's a really great phrase for this particular time. And, uh, and that's what's had to happen, right? So some real public schools worked really hard this summer, as Carrie was noting, um, to take their you know, best planning on what schedules would look like, what kids would need, how they could take breaks. Um, and at the same time, we're beholden to the DESE guidelines of how much instruction kids are supposed to receive. And that's where that negotiated reality comes in with how are we going to make sure that kids get breaks? How are we going to communicate that to families that it's okay for a child to take a break? And I think, you know, two, two and a half weeks in, our pre-K students are only on the, this. Today's day nine, because they start a week later, our kindergarten students as well, um, are still sort of working within that. How long is, what's the right amount of time for a four-year-old to be in front of the screen? before they need to go do something else and then can come back fresh 
for the next learning bite. So uh, let me put you on the spot. Planning. Let me put you on the spot, Lisa. That is a uh, that is a the age old question now, right? Mm -hmm. Pre COVID, parents were trying to figure out how much screen time should they have in front of Netflix. Right. Um, now they're trying to figure out how much screen time they should have in front of their laptop. So right. is there is there a um, universal answer or is it done child by child? Well, I mean, you know, the, the irony here, if you're correct, is that we were just launching a little task force um, with uh, CHA and folks from Shape Up to develop a citywide initiative about screen time right as COVID hit. And we were like, okay, we'll just put that away. Um, you know, the um, Academy of Pediatrics was, you know, less than an hour for really young children. <laughs> um, so, so if we look at those guidelines, it's very different. And so what we've had to do is shift a little bit to think about quality and not quantity and what actually are there are they getting and so when we looked at our pre-k guidelines we started to talk about over the course of a day one and a half to two hours which seemed really reasonable and not all at the same time so what our teachers have been doing is they know from the spring they have a little bit of data about yeah you know initially when kids come on like 10 15 minutes for a morning meeting gradually working up to maybe a little longer show the children how to do something screen goes off and then they go off and do something and then come back okay group two is going to come back at 9 45 and they're going to get a little nugget that they can then take back into their learning experience without being on the screen so it's kind of a dance between being on the screen to get that important content and at the same time being able to use the kit that was sent home by your teacher with the materials that you now have um, and the other piece that we've really been working with families on, and we're, we, we have more messaging to do for sure, is what does it mean to do school at home? And it's not have a screen all day. There have to be opportunities to we're really pushing play, get outside, um, et cetera. It has to happen. Uh, we're working with Somerville Media Center now to uh, turn a, a presentation that our teachers have had called Doing School at Home um, directed to families and that will be um, in, in the form of a little public service announcement that we'll have in various languages and um, that should be coming out in the next week and a half or so. So I'll let you know and maybe you can uh, put that out a little bit. We will and Lisa I see uh, almost every email that goes back and forth between Heather McCormick and yourself and other members of the out of school time task force and, and at the end of this I'm going to give you all a grade. So <laughs> just remember thank that, you. just remember that. I want to flip it, thank you, Lisa. I want to flip it over to Carrie for a second. So Carrie, you have older, an older child in the system. How does that compare to how Lisa and her uh, colleagues kind of format the day for kids? I mean, how is your son's day formatted? So I have a, a junior up at the high school and the high school is doing something very different they are doing um there's not there's week a and week b and in week a you have three classes for an hour and a half each and then um and some of our students have a seventh period whether it's for electives or ap classes things that don't fit easily into the schedule and then they week B and then they have their other three classes for the chunks. And I have, to, so this is the first full week of week B. Um, and my kid at first was like, who thought up this nuttiness? This is insane, right? Uh, I'm used to seven periods in a day and then we move, right? Uh, I would say that it, it, it's, it's just like the little kids, right? You have to learn it, settle into it, figure it out. Um, Wednesday's the asynchronous, the non-live day, but, uh, Evan had a couple of scheduled meetings with instructors and he was like, oh, whoops, because he's used to the, the, the schedule and he's settling into that. And it's, um, you know, it's difficult, right? We, we, there's things that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, Natalia, our student rep to school committee on Monday night was saying the thing about the seventh period, uh, if it's in the afternoon, 
that adds a longer day and some of us have to get to work or we're starting the training for the uh, sports and we're now late. And so is there any way to move all of those classes times to eight o'clock? And when you hear a high school student say, please let me come in earlier, uh, I, yeah. I sit up and take notice because that is an unusual thing for a student to say. So it is, um, there's more independence to it, but there is, it's the same thing, getting used to the whole, the rhythm of it. And then, uh, you know, and we're gonna, next week will be week A, and I think everyone's gonna have to shift gears again on Monday. And so uh, with time, it'll get easier, but it is, even the, it, it, I think it's easier in many ways for the older kids, it's not easy for anyone. Let's, let's just call us. So let me ask this question. I, I like asking questions most of the time that I already have the answer to. But <laughs> when I have professionals in front of me that I have no clue on how to do this, I love to do brain teasers for the both of you. How do you structure a day for a Somerville family who has three children in the Somerville public school system? A junior at the high school? a sixth grader and a pre-K. Ready, set, go. Both of you have 30 <laughs> seconds to answer that question. Really good planning. Uh, I've actually seen some families who took some of our advice about scheduling and making schedules in their house that were visual that they all could see so they could see where those common times were and prioritize things like meeting up for lunch and making sure they all went out for a walk. Um, I think that has really been key to folks who've been successful in this uh, because there, we, that is one thing, and this is a statewide, this is not Somerville. That has been the largest struggle that we're hearing from families is the lack of alignment in a child's schedule because the high school teacher is not calling the fourth grade teacher to say, listen, um, is this gonna work for you all to make sure you can all have lunch together? Um, or that you all get a break at the same time. So that has been um, a logistical problem that um, we haven't been able to solve and no one has been able to solve that. So, but, but really good planning and looking to see where those um, overlaps are has been something that's been successful for, for some families. Gary, imagine yourself in that situation. Well, so a couple, I mean, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have, uh, neighbors or somehow that you can some families are, are coordinating their kids schedules but but let's be real what we also are seeing and I think this is a statewide problem with these schedules is that the older students the high school yes. students some of the ninth grade students are also managing their younger siblings so if you have yeah. your parents have to go to work and they're not available that's who we're relying on and that's what you know frankly that's what had been happening before in person, right? So we had a lot of students in the high school who had to like, it's 2.30 and they're booking out the door to go pick up their younger siblings. Those responsibilities are still there. And what we now are seeing is uh, all three of those different age groups also have uh, these different levels of family responsibilities uh, balancing with school responsibilities. And I think this is where that negotiated reality is going to have to come into play, right? I mean, the that hour and a half block that the high school has, they're not on, on it's not like his teacher's lecturing for an hour and a half. Right. There's different times. And I think uh, students are gonna need to speak up about what their needs are. I mean, that's one of the reasons we have the full-time family liaisons. We have, we've added deans of students. We have a lot of student support. We've created a new students of uh, social emotional learning. What's Kaylee Smith's title? Um, so very intentional that we need students to, to be able to ask for what they need. And then <coughs> teaching staff is also going to be, and has demonstrated a, a, a level of compassion and accountability and how do you balance that out? Um, yeah, I, I think there has, to, there has to be grace throughout this because uh, it's not like a bell is ringing and then everybody just passes through the halls. Um, you know, you're at home, there's the reality of what's happening at home. We are very concerned about young children being at home um, and having the supervision that they need just in general. Um, so yeah, Carrie, it's, re it's really a, a huge issue. 
but as you as you know, you know our student services department has been stellar. Um, all of the support services that we have in place, um, we have to be proactive with that as well because sometimes people don't speak up. They really want to follow the rules and do their their best to maintain, and they don't want to admit that it's hard. Um, and or, or or that something's really not working, and so we have to reach out to, to ask those questions and be consistent in that. Uh, another thing I wanted to quickly mention, though, is there's a, a another space where kids are doing remote learning, and that is in our out of school time programs that are uh, operating full day now. So, for example, the YMCA or the Elizabeth Peabody House Mystic Learning Center, the Y has. Uh, about 64 Somerville Public School students, um, anywhere from K-1 all the way up to fifth and sixth graders in their programs. And, um, and they're learning how to do this too. Um, so how do we communicate with them? And we've uh, just recently been able to make some connection uh, and to offer some support. I, I think we have a little bit more work that we could do in that arena to make sure that children who are being supported by someone other than a custodial parent um, have lines of communication to the school. We know that, that, again, that relationship and having that open communication is what's gonna make it successful for the child, especially when they're struggling. But you can have a situation where there's a child at one computer who's you know, up and down doing their PE class and the child right next to them is supposed to be doing math problems. And so you know, how do we help them structure environments? How do you structure the home environment with your three kids to make sure that you can really focus and concentrate? Um, so, so grace there in helping people to be uh, a little more flexible with schedules and with space so they can be successful. I, I also have to say our teachers are I just have to shout out to the teachers like this is really hard work and everything I said about the children about being adaptive and engaged goes for the teachers as well. They're really committed to making this work and being able to make the shifts on a dime that need to work for a family. It's very impressive. Lisa, I, I agree with you. I have a lot of, you know, teachers, not only in my immediate family, but friends, a lot of teachers and I just I am amazed at the amount of work that they're doing, the amount of dedication that they have to, and as one teacher friend of mine says, they're all my kids. Mm -hmm. So um, let's put it this way, winter is coming. I hate to sound like I'm coming from Game of Thrones, but winter is coming. How are we going to address the physical needs, physical activity needs of younger kids who typically get cabin fever in around Thanksgiving. How are we gonna do that for them? I, I, this has actually been on my mind um, and I've been doing research into companies to find out how we can get better outdoor clothing for every child in Somerville. So a lot of times kids don't go outside um, sometimes kids don't go outside if it's even just raining a little bit. I mean I did I lived in Seattle for 14 years and taught there and I can count you know on two hands the number of times that we didn't take kids outside because we would never go outside if, if we didn't go out when it was raining and so um, but sort of culturally in our in, in this area that's just not what we do and so um, and part of it is that you know teachers are reticent to take kids out families are reticent to take kids out when they don't have proper gear um, I think that's a place where we could look to local businesses or to some grants um, or donations to make sure every child has boots and hats and snowsuits and coats because they're going to have to get up and go outside for a little bit. And those are going to have to be in their home. They'll need that gear and they'll need that gear at school that lives at school so they have it and can be outside when we do go back. Um, I have a suggestion for you. I have a suggestion for you and I've, I've been trying to get the mayor to understand what I'm trying to do here for the kids of Somerville during the winter time. We have a five acre field adjacent to my neighborhood called Trum Field. And the mayor has been very uh, reluctant to allow use during the winter time. Um, as you know, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars re resurfacing that field to make it ready for baseball and the other, the other types of events. 
But I think these are extraordinary times, and I think the mayor, I will pry him off of that stance that he's taken. And I think we can do a program with all of us reaching out to maybe some of the ski resorts in donating cross-country skis mm -hmm. and some equipment and some clothing for the kids of this city, and we can create a cross-country track for them on that five acres over there. And I would challenge Dr. Tony Monaco to do the same thing with his ski club up at Tufts University uh -huh. and open up something on his fields. And I would challenge the state to do something at Dillboy to do the same thing. Outdoor winter sports are not something that, that we should neglect. Snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, building igloos, I don't care. But we've got to give these kids an outlet during the summertime, during the winter time coming up. Right. And I think one argument has been, well, it takes a long time to get kids into gear and out of it. And that cuts into instructional time. And, you know, it's a life skill. And I think we've got to uh, stop just shutting the door on November, you know, 14th or whenever we deem it uh, to be too cold or too wet to go outside. Uh, we've got we've got to change that culture, and I think that's something that can be part of shape up Somerville. How this? I have certain powers of persuasion. And I'm going to make a commitment to both of you. I will call Linda Bean from LL Bean, and I'll see what she's got hanging around the warehouse up there, and I'll try to get something. They they have a very powerful philanthropic arm, and I I have just started to do research, and I'd love to work with you on that. Yeah, Lisa, I don't go through philanthropic arms. I call the company CEO. Do it. There you, do it. there you go. Carrie. Uh, just a quick shout out to athletic director uh, Stan Vieira, who came into us last year when there were no gyms and now we have a pandemic. He has set up in Dilma, we're not running uh, competitive sports, but he has set it up to, to training. Uh, and so the kids were using it staggered safely. So there are, you know, the kids need to use the bathroom. We won't have huge cohorts there. Um, he understands the importance, not just of being together, the physical activity of especially middle school and teenagers being with adults other than their parents. It's such an important part of their development. And so he has been very creative in that. And I, I think would be very open to any ideas and any support to increase that and continue it through the winter months. Listen, you just got to tell me where to send all this stuff from LLB. I, I, I'm, not, I'm just going to do it. Um, we've got about 10 seconds left. Lisa Q, Carrie Normand, my hat, my salute goes to the both of you. I mean, continuing on, you know, where uh, Lisa, I think you said nine days, 10 days into this. Um, you know, there's a lot more work ahead and there's going to be a lot more roadblocks and speed bumps and potholes and everything else coming up in the winter months. So whatever we can do, we're going to help. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you both. Dr. Lisa Q, Director of Early Education, Carrie Norman, Chair of the Somerville School Committee. Thank you for coming. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.